All right, welcome to math 408, L functions and sphere packing. So for this week, we are going to you know, finish our talk about trying to construct a modular form. There are you know, classical expositions. We're going to do just a little bit of it. I'm more concerned or more interested in the thought process behind how you would construct some of these objects than how you would actually construct the objects. On Wednesday, we have a special class. It's going to be a class on you know, big data sets and whatnot. It's really not so related to this class, but it's a time frame that works for the speaker, and it's something that is worthwhile for everyone to hear. And then Friday, we will start really going into the connections with sphere packing, which has been you know, a little bit more conjectural right now, but now we will have the language. So the first item we need to do is to talk about how we would build modular forms. So modular forms. And I'm being a little bit vague. I'm not talking about their behavior at infinity or whatnot. You know, basically these are complex differentiable functions that have a nice transformation property. So for us, we'll be on PSL2Z. So this is just SL2Z where we mod out plus or minus the identity. So we consider plus and minus the identity to have the same effect. And if gamma is A, B, C, D is in there, then we want F of gamma of Z to be C, Z plus D to the 2K F of Z. And the question is, do such objects exist? Any thoughts on what we can do to try to find such an object? Now, we have different choices of k. You know, k is in 0, 1, 2. Any thoughts about what might be the easiest k to study? All right, k equals 0. So let's try k equals 0. Any thoughts on a possible form? Uh, if the matrix is the identity, then if k equals zero, then this like multiplied by one, right? Well, in fact, it doesn't matter what the matrix is. Because k is zero, no matter what matrix you choose, you would get f of gamma z is f oh, of z. So this is extremely restrictive. Any thoughts on a function that might work? Any constant. Any constant. Anything else? If not, I have a function I'll propose. So we want a function such that f of gamma z is f of z. Any thoughts as to how you might define a function that will have that property? How about the delta function? All right, so what is the delta function? Okay, but that's not continuous, that's not differentiable. Oh, okay. But if you chose that, uh, when you applied gamma, that would shift z to another point, and so it would not actually satisfy this relation. Okay, so is that the only thing that would work? Not every z is equivalent to every other z. Because remember, the gammas have to be in SL2z. Mm -hmm. So we have our fundamental domain, minus 1, 1, 0, minus a half, a half. All 
I mean, you know, I'm not going to deal with the boundary. But we can map any point to be in the fundamental domain. But that's not the same as saying we can map any point to any point by using an FL2Z matrix. It could be that the only thing that works is the constants. And if that's the case, then k equals zero is a very boring space. But let's think about what we would need to happen. So here is some z. Here's tz. Here's t squared z. Here's t, um, t inverse of z. Here is sz, maybe um, t, sz, and so on. And the value of the function has to be the same at all of these points. It doesn't have to be the same value as we change what z is, but at all these points it has to be the same. Any thought about how we might try to get a function that is going to be the same at all of these places? Okay, but then if it's zero at all those places, this has to be true for any choice of z. Oh, yeah, right. So for each choice of z, all of these values have to be the same. So any thoughts about what we might be able to try? And it's okay if it doesn't work. Maybe make f of z a sum. What might be a good sum to look at? Sum of all integers. OK, sum of all integers of what? Z. So tz, where's the m coming into play? So tz has no m dependent. Oh, oh, t to the m. So t to the mz. OK. So if I look at this, if I change does this satisfy f of tz equals f of z? I'm sorry? OK, we'll, 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 worry, we'll worry about convergence later. You know, right now, we're just working formally. Will this satisfy f of tz equals f of z? Well, no, we're put negative integers. Yeah, we're summing over the negative integers, too. So m will go from minus infinity to infinity. Then this will be true. But it won't converge. Okay, should we be a little bit happy about this? What's promising about this? It doesn't change when you apply t to it. Right, so it's at least invariant under t. But we want it to be invariant under all of SL2z. Is it enough to be invariant under just t, or what else do we need? So what else should we have? But you have to make sure that it works for any word in S's and T's. Yeah. So this doesn't quite work yet, and it doesn't converge. So we have two ways to go. We can take our function that doesn't converge, which is good with respect to T, but not good with respect to S, and make it good with respect to S as well. Or we could first try to come up with a cousin of this which converges. And then once we get something of that that converges, then work on bringing in S. Either way is fine. We have two choices. But we've got to fix one of the issues. What are the thoughts? Do 
Do you want to try to get it to work with respect to S or do you want to try to get it to converge? One of them I think will be easier than the other. Right, let's try to get it to converge. Let's go for convergence. If we can't even make it converge, then I'm worried about trying to put an S as well. So what might we do to make things converge? So Fz is the sum and goes to minus infinity to infinity. So we had t to the mz. How could I modify this? So why are you worried about convergence? Because in comparison, you can't bear any other peaks of continuity without finding any peaks of continuity. Well, well, what happens is we keep taking higher and higher powers of t. The real part of z goes to infinity. The real part of z goes to infinity, but it also goes to negative infinity. Could we argue that maybe they cancel? Yes, yeah, it's a complex part. Good. So even if we could make such an argument, yeah. The complex part is still going to be there, and it's going to be reinforced every single time. So even if real parts cancel, imaginary parts reinforce. And so we have an issue here. It's worth recalling the Cauchy distribution. So that's f of x is 1 over pi, 1 over 1 plus x squared. And big f of x, which is the antiderivative, is arctangent of x divided by pi. It's a nice exercise to prove that. So I, I won't make it homework, but I strongly encourage you to be able to prove that the derivative of arctangent is 1 over 1 plus x squared. Why is this important? Well, if we try to calculate the mean, it's technically the limit as a and b go to infinity of the integral from minus a to b of x times 1 over pi, 1 over 1 plus x squared dx. This is what it really means for an integral to exist. As I expand out to infinity in any way, I should get something that is finite and convergent. This is not quite the same as saying if I put in absolute values, it's finite. So there's, a, there's several different notions of what does it mean for an integral to converge. And if I look at this, if I take b equals a, we get 0. And if I take b equals twice a, it basically gives me 1 over b, the integral from a to 2a of x over 1 plus x squared. Well, when x is very, very large, x over 1 plus x squared is approximately 1 over x. Its antiderivative is log. So this would be the log of 2a minus the log of a. So it's basically the log of 2 over pi. And if I replace the 2 with a 3 or a 4 or a 5, I could make this whatever I want over here. So this proves that if I want to look at this integral, it depends on how I go to infinity. There are other integrals that actually still exist, even if they're not L1 integrable. You know, if you look at the integral from minus infinity to infinity of sine of x over x dx, well, this is an odd function. So you, you want to say it should be 0, but this is an odd function as well. The point is you have nice changing of signs. You, know, you have a region where it's positive and then a region where it's negative. And as you go further and further down, because the x is increasing in the denominator, the contribution to the integral from each period is smaller in absolute value than the previous. 
So as you march down, you have an alternating sum to the right, you have an alternating sum to the left. This integral will converge. Even though the absolute value of the integral diverges. So it's, you know, this is a senior seminar. It's worth seeing how things connect. So when we go to this, if we just sum t to the mz, it's not going to work. What could we try to do to make this work now? Any thoughts about what we could try to do? And again, I don't care if it works or doesn't work. I'm more concerned about the thought process today. So these numbers are getting very, very large, right? What might we do to make sure that they don't get very, very large? So we, 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 could, we could add a decaying factor that depends on m, and we lose but then we lose the fact that it's invariant under t. So what could we do to tmz? What do you mean by t to the z? Yep, so you, you can't do t to the 1 over m. And if you did t to the 1 over m, then the, the question is, would it still be invariant under t? It's not a bad thing to try, but what can I do? Instead of summing tm to the z, what should I sum? So one po so great. So one possibility is one over tm to the z, or more generally, choose some function g, and put some function g there. So the first suggestion from class is let g of u equal one over u. But you immediately realize you don't want to do that. So why don't you want to do that? Well, you just give that stuff. Oh, you mean, what do you mean by tg of the new people is tg of tg or something? Or like, yeah. So do we lose t invariant? You know, if, if we look at this function, would this function be t invariant? F of tz would be the sum and goes from minus infinity to infinity of g of t to the m tz, it's still going to be f of tz, it's still going to be f of z. So it's still t invariant. So it's still better than z? Yeah, the problem is you've got the function 1 over u. 1 over u terrifies me. You know, it's related to the harmonic series. I don't know if there's enough decay. What could we? So 1 over u squared, but let's cover our asses. Instead of doing 1 over u squared, what should we do? You know, fix some power, r or p or a. Let's do, let's do some p, where maybe p is greater than or equal to 2. Why do you think I'm doing 2 and not 1? And I'm not sure that 2 is going to be enough. Yeah, it's a p-series thing now. We are in the plane, but we are fixing z. And so it might be enough to just take p greater than 1. So really, it's probably sufficient to look maybe when p is greater than 1. But if I give myself a free parameter, we can then see, is there a choice of this parameter that will work? And so what we're trying to do is we're trying to build a periodic function So we are choosing the very special case where the function g is related to 1 over. It's 1 over to a power. More generally, we need to assume, or we might want to give ourselves the power to choose a more general g. You know, choose a g that has nice decay. 
what's nice is if you look at the set you know t to the m z this is equal to the same as t times t to the m z and so now we just need to worry about convergence so let's say f of z is the sum and goes from minus infinity to infinity of 1 over pmz to the pth power. So it's the sum and goes from minus infinity to infinity of 1 over z plus m to the p. Will this converge? And if so, when? So will it converge for all z if p is greater than 1? Yes. Why? Because you can take what the sum is less than 1. So z is has a complex part. What kind of complex part are we assuming z has? Where do we assume z lives? So z equals x plus i y lives in the upper half plane. Therefore, y is greater than 0. Therefore, z does not equal negative integer. Because the only problem is if z is negative integer. And as long as p is greater than 1, this is essentially a p-series from calculus. So converges if p is greater than 1. What's the denominator? Z plus? Z plus m, m to the p. Because what t to the m z does is it shifts by... M. And to recall, you know, t is 1, 1, 0, 1. t of z is just going to be z plus 1 over 1 is z plus 1. So by induction, tmz is just z plus m. So this works. More generally, if we take maybe f sub g of z to be the sum and goes from minus infinity to infinity of g of tmz, will this converge if g is nice? Yeah. yeah. OK, if g is nice. And as long as g has reasonable decay, we're going to be OK. So again, this is a very non-standard way of doing modular forms. And the main reason is because I don't really care right now too much about specific modular forms. What I care about is the search for a representative. And so when we were doing the interpolation formulas, one of the things I mentioned <coughs> is that you know, several people proved you could do great sphere packing if you could find a function that had certain properties. And then it becomes a search for such a function. OK, so I like using the 1 over function. You know, we're using 1 over to the p power. Unfortunately, almost surely, this is not going to be invariant under the action of everything in SL2z. You know, when we apply s, it's going to be bad. And if I haven't defined the word invariant before, that just means it's unchanged. And that's essentially what we mean by f of z is f of gamma of z, that when you apply a element of SL2z, it doesn't change. So we need to continue to extend and get for all gamma in SL2z, or maybe PSL2z. Any thoughts on how we might want to extend things? So old was f of z was the sum and goes from minus infinity to infinity of 1 over tmz to the pth power. 
What should our new thing be? To try to find a G that's invariant under S. So one is to try to find a G that's invariant under S. Um, but then we have to apply any. Okay, so. So what? So if we try to find a G that's invariant under S, if we looked at F of, say, some gamma of Z, maybe that's F of T to the K1 S to the L1 T to the K2 S to the K2 dot 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 uh, T to the K Q S oops, these should be L's, to the L Q times Z. And if it's invariant under S, oops, sorry. when we start plugging it in here, the S over here would be no problem, but then we would shift and then we would apply S again. So it's not a bad thing to try, but I think it's going to be difficult to make it work in practice. We need to find something that will be invariant under anything in PSL2Z. We found a way to get something invariant under everything that's generated by just T. So what could we try? Would you like me to rewrite this in a way that might be more indicative? This is the sum over gamma in the group generated by T of 1 over gamma of Z to the P. So is that the same as what we just had? Again, it may not work, but it's at least a natural thing to try. And, you know, again, this is one of, to me, the most important parts of the whole semester, is thinking about how would you attack something, thinking about how you would generalize. Once I read it like this, is it clear how to generalize? Why is this clearer than this? It's coming down to algebra. It's coming down to trying to figure out the right way to look at things. I should have brought one of the special Rubik's cubes where it's a three by three cube, but you have to hold it at a 45 degree or a 60 degree angle depending on which one it is. And it's designed to hide what's going on. What we've really done is we've just summed over all the gamma that are in the group generated by T. So let's sum over all the gamma in SL2Z or maybe PSL2Z, I don't know, I don't care of 1 over gamma z to the p. This should be a natural thing to study. What are the questions you have about this? Converge. Does it converge? And what else? So the other one is hopefully going to be easy to prove, but there is something we should check. Converge. And the other question, does f of gz equal f of z? Hopefully, one of them isn't too bad. Hopefully, the fact that it's invariant, unchanged, under the action of SL2Z. So we need to show that G times SL2Z is basically SL2Z. If we take something in SL2Z and apply G, could two different things be mapped to the same thing? You know, let's say G gamma 1 equals G gamma 2. What can you conclude? Multiply by G inverse, and so you get gamma 1 equals gamma 2. 
So distinct elements are mapped to distinct elements when we apply G. The next thing is we have to show everything is hit. Given gamma in SL2Z, have G times G inverse gamma equals gamma. So this gives us 1 to 1 or injective. This gives us that it's onto. And so we do know that we will have something that is invariant under all of SL2Z. Are we done? All right, what's the concern now? The concern now is convergence. Are you more worried about convergence here? I'm much more worried about convergence here. Right. Now again, one other question you could ask is, instead of just doing 1 over gamma z, we could actually apply some function that has good decay rather than doing the 1 over to the pth power. And if that's the case, are we generating infinitely many uh, constant modular forms? And that might be a problem in terms of what is the dimension of the space. There are some additional conditions you want about behavior going to infinity. And so I'm, I'm not putting those in for now. Right now I'm just concerned, can we find good candidates? But we actually do have a little bit more freedom because we could put in some function instead of the one over to the pth power, we could put in some function that has good decay. What's your go-to choice? Normal Gaussian, exactly. Gaussian has wonderful decay. Some nice Schwartz function might be a good go-to. So let's see what would happen over here. You know, would we have enough decay? So how do we answer the decay question? So we know that f of z would be less than or equal to the sum over gamma in SL2z of maybe 1 over the length of gamma z to the p. And if that sum converges, then we're golden. So we just need to show that that sum converges. All right, so let's say gamma is A, B, C, D. So gamma of Z, A plus B, C, Z plus D. We have to calculate the norm. Right? So gamma of z is az plus b c z bar plus d. Is that what I want? Over c z plus d, c z bar plus d. And so the denominator would become c squared z squared um, plus dc z bar plus dz c to be plus cd twice uh, 
imaginary part I think of Z times I plus D squared. Is it the real part? Oh, no, sorry, good, it's the real part. Good, good, it's the real part. Sure, so we have CZ plus D times CZ bar plus D. So you'll get C squared ZZ bar, or C squared absolute value of Z squared. You'll have the D times D, which is a D squared. And then you'll have CDZ bar, CDZ. So the imaginary parts cancel, the real parts reinforce, and you get two CD real part of Z. What can you tell me about this denominator? Could it be zero? So the denominator is greater than c squared real part of z squared plus 2 cd real part of z plus d squared, which is c real part of z plus d squared. Because this has an imaginary part. And so when I drop the imaginary part, I make it smaller. So the denominator is going to be greater than something squared, something real squared. So the denominator has to be positive. So we at least never have a denominator that vanishes. That's good. The denominator will be a positive real number. Wait, can z be zero? Or no, because if z is zero, then it would not be in the upper half plane. Uh, I see. So this is because... So now, when you look at the top, we will have AC length of Z squared plus BC Z bar plus AD Z plus BD. Right? So what do we need to figure out now? And again, I don't really care if we get the answer or not. I care about the thought process. I care what do we want to know about gamma of z. It's going to be. Now, you do know that the norm of a product is the product of the norms. So we do know that the absolute value of gamma of z is actually equal to the absolute value of az plus b over the absolute value of cz plus d. What is your big fear? Because this is an infinite sum. Does it converge? Okay, so why would it not converge? So what will prevent it from converging? Well, if the alternating series converges, the absolute values don't, then it would be it would be that. Well, we could choose P whatever we want. If we need to be, if we need P to be 2020, we'll make P 2020. But what's your fear? What could prevent it from converging? The S's will send points near the real axis uh, to values approaching infinity. Um, well, if, 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 if gamma Z is approaching infinity, then that's going to be a large number. And if it's a large number, that should help us with convergence. 
No, what he's saying is an S gamma Z would be really small number. Oh, S gamma Z would be really small. So if, okay, so if we have something going off to infinity, um, then S of gamma of Z is going to diverge. So if you look at T to the 2000 Z, that's Z plus M, that's going to have a very large norm. Right? And then if you apply S to that, that's going to be negative 1 over z plus m, and that's going to have a very small norm. How many such points can we get? As many as we want. So the question is, um, well, let's see. Because we're taking 1 over, when we now have this as our point, it's going to come up in the numerator. Is there any way to salvage this? No. This is not salvageable. And this is good, because if it was, I could put in some other function in front of the, instead of the 1 over to the p power, and I would be able to create a wealth of modular forms. What's really going on is when we look at the fundamental domain, Yes? Okay. Negative one, one, negative a half, one half. And so this is the fundamental domain, and this is S of the fundamental domain. And you're going to be getting lots of things coming in over here in this region. And so you'll be able to get a whole slew of points converging to zero. And the problem is, in order for this to converge, we need to have some control over how many times will gamma of z give us the same norm. Or give us a norm that's bounded between r and 2r, or something like that. We need some control over how many elements, how many gammas, give us a small norm, give us a large norm. And what we see here is, you know, this is a great example. This gives us a sequence of points where, you know, t to the mz is, oh, I, I like how I have 2,000 on the left-hand side and m on the right-hand side. Excellent. Um, so I, I will add m equals 2,000. So it tells us that this idea does not work. Now, there are other situations where you can do some kind of averaging like this and construct a form. It's called the method of images, where you basically do some kind of averaging. Why do you think it fails here? Because it works so well initially. Because it works so well initially. Because it works so well initially. What's the cause for the disaster? So one thing is just you know, the effort is hard to work with. We just have too many things that we're averaging over. And the behavior is varying too much. With the t to the m z, we were just marching down the line. And all the points were going off to infinity. When we look at how many gamma is f of t z, it's great. We no longer have things marching off to infinity. With this, we also have things converging down to zero and converging to various places. And the behavior is just too uncontrolled. But the sum is just too large. And so based on this, what, you, what might you conjecture? So, so one possible conjecture might be that the only way this is going to work is if we have a constant function. I will just end the day with an example of a weight flow form. So this is the Ramanujan tau function. So let's do the e 
the Q R I V, and then consider the function if I can bring this up, is Q product integral from one to infinity of one minus Q V N. And that would be a modular form of break cell. When you look at this, it's not going to be easy as to why this is a modular form, why this transforms an answer. What do we need to test to see if something is a modular form? Do we have to test all of F of QG? So what do we need to test? F and Q. F and Q, that's all we need to do is test F and Q. And if it transforms nicely under F and Q, then we're done. All right, so this is a good place to stop. Uh, for the next class, we can either we can either do a example, and I will actually give you nothing that's a modular form, and you will check and see that it works. Or it can be a homework. Let me know if you want to do it as a homework problem, or if you want to do it in class. Just let me know. Wednesday's class is going to be a Zoom lecture from a William Belong. And I will not come here in person. Uh, there's really no point. I'm going to zoom.